Hello, yet more of the 24, 25 hour live show excerpts. How many are there going to be? Well, probably between 24 and 25 because each one's about an hour long. So this one involves the person who I normally do a big live Christmas show with every year in Hammersmith. It's Brian Cox. You sent in your questions. We managed to deal with about two of them because, of course, being a physicist, he does expand. And uh, on top of that, we've also got um, Helen Arney from the Festival of the Spoken Nerd and Sebley Delar showing you some of the incredible laser work that he's been doing during lockdown and actually did on that night of the 12th of December and also winner of Britain's Got Talent, Lost Voice Guy. So we had a fantastic night and I hope you're enjoying some of these elements and clips of that show. Uh, thank you, lovely audience, for coming down as well. We're going to uh, have some music now and uh, I, like I said before, I really do. Oh, are you joining in again as well? Oh, OK. Well, why not just do it anyway, even if they're not expecting it? Just start banging a thing or playing the trumpet or whatever. Yeah, Helen's very forgiving. Oh, yeah, she'll away. be forgiving. She'll, she'll be absolutely... Uh, I'll mention again to anyone who's just joined us recently, uh, the uh, the thing that I announced at 6 o'clock is later on this evening, at probably around 10.30pm, uh, we have uh, three exclusive tracks that Robert Smith uh, of The Cure has uh, recorded for us. Uh, from, it was uh, This year was the 40th anniversary of 17 Seconds, the album 17 Seconds, and and, uh, and he's recorded three tracks uh, from that acoustically, though very much in a cure acoustic manner as well. It's not just a wooden guitar. Uh, and uh, also uh, coming up, Stuart Lee's coming up. We've got our all-star Christmas Carol with uh, Eddie Azard, Joe Brand, uh, Guy Pearce, and loads of other people on that as well. Uh, I've got another announcement that I'll make probably quite soon. We've got Brian Cox is uh, joining us. He's going to be at 7 o'clock. And uh, Ben Goldacre's coming up as well. Sometime we've got Milton Jones well we've got a lot more things coming up anyway uh we better do because we've still got 18 hours to go so uh this is uh, thank you for joining us uh and uh, i also mentioned our crowdfunder as well um it would be great I, i'm not sure where we're going to get to in the end but it's i, I know that a while ago we'd got to about fifteen thousand pounds mention again those charities which are turned to us which is helping people dealing with uh financial difficulties and poverty dif uh poverty problems we've got uh medicine sans frontier and if anyone has ever met any of the people who work for medicine sans frontier absolutely remarkable the work that they do dealing with the the victims of war is is just just amazing uh we have got also the uh, king's place uh music foundation as well is another one and uh, mind which of course is a great charity for dealing uh with uh, with mental health as well so thank you very much everyone who's able to support us uh for those things and also there is our patreon thing as well which as i've said we've been putting out between four and ten shows a week uh over the lockdown which we all kind of basically make for free and uh, we're just trying to get so we can keep making more stuff. Um, now I'm going to hand you over to someone who uh, I have probably been doing these shows almost. I don't. Th I think she might have missed the first year or the second year. Uh, she is uh, one third a festival of the spoken nerd, and uh, she has uh, a song for us. So please welcome either in this room or whatever room you're in, whichever screen you're looking at, Helen Arney. Hello. I'm Helen Arney. I hope you're enjoying the show wherever it is that you're awake, especially if you're awake when you should be asleep. I've got a um, six-month-old lockdown baby upstairs, so whatever time zone you're watching this in, I'm probably awake as well. So uh, it's fine. I've had a coffee and I'm here to sing the most festive song I could think of because what could be more festive than the building blocks of the universe? Obviously, I'm going to sing you Tom Lehrer's Elements. Uh, I don't know what else, but to give it a go, you know, cheer when you hear your favourite element, if you have understanding neighbours. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and rhenium and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium and lanthanum and osmium and astatine and radium and gold and protactinium and indium and gallium. And iodine and thorium and folium and thallium. La 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 la. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolidium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuthium, and lithium, beryllium, and barium. La 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 la. Shall we do this at the right speed? There's. 
Holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercury and molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scanium and cerium and cesium and leprosium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. La 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 la. Sulfur, californium, and fernium, pecilium, and also medallium, and stanium, nobelium, and alcohol, cryptonium, radon, zinc, and zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, copper, 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 tungsten, tin, and sodium. Okay, calm down for a moment because uh, this song was written in 1959, and since then another 16 elements have been discovered. Don't worry, I've got it covered. We've got laurentium, mitnerium, dumstradium, seaborgium, rontgenium and dubnium, fluorovium and borium, copernicium, livermorium and hassium, rutherfordium, organison and tennessine, these are the new ones, muscovium, nihonium. Of course, this doesn't mean that the periodic table is finished. Uh, more elements might be discovered or more accurately synthesised for a fraction of a second in a laboratory. I've got that one sorted too. I'd like to add those elements which one day may be discovered. But it took so long to learn this song, I really can't be bothered. La 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 la. Thank you very much. Um, Robin says we're allowed to plug something. Uh, so if you want to see a live version of that song, yeah, remember when people could see things and do stuff and go to theatres. Wow! Uh, I've recorded a bunch of shows with Festival of the Spoken Nerd. Um, you can get all of our shows on DVD. Remember those. Um, free coaster with every purchase. And uh, on download as well. You can get HD downloads. And they are from here. And um, they cost uh, pi, pi pounds each. 3.14. Um, stop, we couldn't get any more decimal places, shop wouldn't let us. Um, uh, so, right, the problem with this song, this this element song, is it's um, it's quite addictive. Uh, it's not just addictive um, to sing, it's addictive to start making your own versions of, and I don't know if anyone out there has done this, but I, I, I've made quite quite a few now so um, I'm gonna just keep doing them until I run out of time in my seven minute segment um, so there's one that I wrote for our Radio 4 show Domestic Science um, so I got commissioned by the BBC to write a version of the Elements song and I think it's so relevant now this is the perfect song for 2020 because no matter where you are and no matter what you're doing you are not alone because your stomach is home to more bacteria fungi and archaea than there are cells in your entire body. There's Peptococcus, Streptococcus, Fecalibacterium, Valenella, Salmonella, and Fusobacterium, Plasiomonas, Pseudomonas, also Eubacterium, and Prevotella, Morganella, and Mycobacterium, there's Kepsiella, Iconella, and Flavobacterium, Lactobacillus, and Bacillus, Propionibacterium, and Citrobacter, Sarcina, Staphylococcus, Vibrio, Enterobacter, Bacteroides, and Butyri, Vibrio, la 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 Escherichia, E. coli, there, and Corine bacterium, Helicobacter, Haemophilus, Bifidobacterium, Captain Hyndophagia, don't forget Ruminococcus, Esmethanoprevobacter, and Acidaminococcus. If you're feeling quite alone, just think of all the things inside of ya. Peptostreptococcus, Proteus, and Acamancia. Alright, there's another one. This one, um, it's another commission from the Welcome Genome Campus. Um, they basically asked me to write a song, so I put 56 fruit fly genes to the tune of a uh, uh, song by Arthur Sullivan. Why not? There's Cleopatra, Capulet, Cap and Collar, Chickadee, Breathless, Bric-a-Brac, Hairy Ken and Barbie, Jelly Belly, Swiss Cheese, Genghis Khan and Gooseberry, Sloppy Paired, Slowpoke, Slipper Patch and Say Your Peas, Hot Prospero and Pangolin, Pavarotti, Pygopus, Crocodile, Cootie Dumpling, Current Bun and Clump, Fuss, Sex, Lethal, Saxophone, Sun and Bride of Seveners, Brainiac, Amnesiac, Giant, Runt and Tailless, la 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 these are all genuine fruit fly names. I got someone with a PhD in fruit flies to look at it. There's double part dead pan, dax, hunt and dodo, mastermind, menage a trois, nautilus and nemo, hopscotch, hatchback, highway, hedgehog, homeless, hamlet and hippo, tubby, tin man, take up t shirt, talking tango, torpedo, la 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 la
has lots of dross and filler. But these jeans are the ones that will make it androsophila. La 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 la. And I've got one more version. Final one. I only wrote this to annoy Matt Parker. There's 41, 28, 32, 17, 26, 31, 43, and 16, 13, 24, 45, and 19, 37, 47, Matic number, yes, it's 3, 39, 44, 23, and 15, 38, 49, 46, and 50, 33, 35, all the answers, 42, 29, 18, 48, and 22, la 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 la, there's 21, 36, 25, and 14, 13, 34, 27, 40, 2 and 5 and 8 and 9 and 1 and 10 and 7, 4 and 6 and 20, 12 and don't forget 11, I'm sorry that I only did the numbers 1 to 50, when I get the time I'll carry on and to infinity, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen Arney. And thank you very much to our audience who came down for this afternoon as well. Thank you so much. I'm sorry it's not a normal year. I hope you're at least enjoying our abnormal show that we're going to do next year. With luck, we'll be back doing our normal show with everyone just on stage and the whole kind of ridiculous bands and all of that kind of stuff. But Steve, you are a ridiculous band in yourself. You are, uh, and I mean that, as you know, as a very high compliment. So thank you again for everyone for coming down. And thank you because your tickets, basically most of that money goes to those four charities that I mentioned. So thank you. I'm sorry to see you go. The, uh, now, Steve, I've got to do this now. Yeah, do, which do you want a drum roll for it? Absolute disaster. <laughs> because uh, for those of you watching at home, you'll know about this, which is uh, Ginny Smith decided that a good idea to check about my slow decline or rapid decline as I get less and less sleep was to do Bop It Extreme, not realising that I've never played Bop It Extreme. Now, if you've never played Bop It Extreme, it means that you start off at a very low level and then you go slightly worse. So let's find out. Are you going to give me a little bit of a I'll give you a little drum up? roll if you like. Yeah, go for it. Right, beat bop solo. Oh, hang on. Do I need? I need beat bop. All right. No, it, it doesn't even do. It won't do with the solo. It won't. Hang on. It's not giving me vox. It's changed. <laughs> Right, hang on, we're nearly there. Right, solo, it's not. No, that's not the one I've played. What, what mode do you need? I need the one that just tells me what to do. Beatbox, yeah. Beatbox, solo. Right. No expert, I'm afraid. I don't know what those sound <laughs> effects mean. I'm 51 I've got years no old. I do either. No, we're going to keep going. We've Let's got, keep oh, going. This is wait, not. Robin, Robin. I think you're using a different one, the one on stage, the one on, on the table. Oh, someone... Oh, yeah. Thanks very what much, the by the way. This is the one that I was given last night to practice on, which it turns out doesn't even work. Right, here we go. You're right. This is the one I've been using. So, let's return to this. Right. Here we go. Oh. Ah, oh, two. There we are. So I'm in total decline and we have 18 hours to go. Um, we are now going to go over live to someone who has done uh, some... They've done some brilliant work, really. I mean, earlier on, you saw Steve, of course, has that amazing uh, laser harp, which is always a joy to see. And then Sebley Delisle, for those of you who have not seen this, and I hope you've been... Fun for Oh, hang on a minute. Before, before we go to Seb, so in a minute we'll be... So basically, look, what's coming up is uh, Seb Lee Delisle is going to be about the lasers that he's been basically setting up, the stuff that he's been doing uh, around cities across the UK. And we're going to see some of the work that he's been doing tonight. Uh, we're going to... Uh, Brian Cox is coming up very, very soon. We've got Ben Goldacre joining us very soon. Uh, we've got Stuart Lee, and we've got that all-star uh, Christmas Carol, amongst other things. We're still just... a oh, Lost Voice guy, Andrea Seller. And we're also going to have an update from Chris Lintot as well about the kind of search for supernovas. But first of all, let's go over to Matt and find out how the cartooning's going. Hello, Matt. 
Hello, Robin. Can you hear me all right? Right, that is good. That wall is looking a lot more Here complete. We Here we go. So you can see we've got, we've got six things behind us now. There's a really lovely um, mix of, of poignant things and funny things and silly things all uh, colliding and juxtaposing. Uh, so as you can see, I'm kind of running out of space in my wall now, so about a quarter of the way through. Uh, on the desk in front of me, I've got the uh, some some of our astronauts um, captures there. Oh, get rid of me there, uh, and I'm just about to start uh, working on some of our, our Santa Claus uh, theme. Theme, the real name of Santa Claus, now revealed uh, into pain, and then we'll be looking at, at the COVID stuff. So it's uh, a bit of catching up to do, but it's it's. Uh, it's been a joy to follow along and to, to pull out some of those fun and poignant moments. What, what has been the most fun to draw so far? Is there a moment where you heard a word or a phrase and you went, yes, this is what the pen's been waiting for? It's, it's not the best drawing, but it's, it's uh, caused me the most smile, which is giving yourself uh, a, lovely, a lovely haircut to, uh, um, yeah, with the, the braids and the shaved head. Is a, it's good. I think you should try it out. Money's Brilliant. Very, very That's better. wonderful. Well, there's a lot of things. By the time it gets to six o'clock tomorrow morning, I'll be trying out all manner of stuff, mate. It's going to be great. Thank you very much, Matt. You're going to be keeping up with that, and we'll be joining you again to find out where you've got to very, very soon. It's brilliantly right. beautiful work. Thank you. Cool. Keep it up. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be joining uh, Matt uh, later on. But first of all, we're going to go to, and Brian Cox in 10 minutes' time, uh, we're going to go over to Seb Lee Delisle, who is doing amazing work with lasers, as usual. Um, Seb, can you hear me yet? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Now, tell us a little bit about, because I've been looking at your stuff on social media and some of the towns that you've been <laughs> lighting up. It is absolutely remarkable. What, give us a little bit of a gist of, of what you've been playing with. Well, it all started way back at the beginning of the year when all my work was cancelled, right? <laughs> so I've been building this project to replace fireworks and and uh, I've built these incredible touch-sensitive light sticks that trigger fireworks. And yeah, and so I'd had like a whole year of those bookings, which just almost immediately disappeared. So I think you remember, you know, because I spoke to you, right, earlier in May, I think mm. it was, and we were talking about some of the stuff I'd been experimenting with, um, projecting on buildings nearby to thank the NHS. And it kind of inspired me to come up with a project that might work with social distancing in place, something that the light festivals could use um, or could book with confidence. Because right back then, we didn't really have a clue what was going to happen, whether we'd be allowed out by the end of the year or not. Um, I mean, I suspected we wouldn't. So I, I came up with this project, Laser Light City, where essentially I just get the biggest lasers I can get, <laughs> get my hands on and point them in the sky and give full control of the movement and the pattern and the color to random members of the public. And um, so I got a bit of funding over the summer to work on it and then uh, did a first test version in Brighton at three sites. And then Light Night Leeds like, got fully behind the project and they booked it for their uh, festival this year and we installed it on a huge scale. Uh, seven sites, I had about 20 crew. We just had 25 really big lasers and these lasers are like three or four times bigger than the ones that you've seen me work with before, right? Bigger than the ones we had at Albert Hall a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, so I just got loads and loads of them. I was in Worthing. I set them up on the pier the last few days, so I'm absolutely exhausted. And I just got back <laughs> really late last night, and so I just set up a laser on the back on my patio. You can see it there pointing out to sea, and if you want to have a play with that laser, you can go to laserlight.city. I've also enlisted a couple of friends around the country so i've got a friend in leamington spa with a couple of big lasers on a tower block there and another friend uh rob stanley stanwax laser in north wales and he's got a ridiculous laser so he's got a 40 watt green laser which i think is adapted from medical equipment he's like he's like really a laser genius and that 40 watt laser just of pure green is something to behold that will be seen for absolutely miles around yeah and i've got another really huge installation coming up at the end of the year i'm not allowed to talk about it yet but that's similar scale to leeds but even bigger lasers so yeah just keep an eye out for that 
See, that's what I love is the fact that earlier on in this conversation you said, I just set up the biggest laser possible and then give <laughs> random members of the public control of it. And that, that feels very much, again, like that first scene in the movie where we know things are not going to end up well. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's that sort of, that, that magical illusion of danger, really, um, because obviously the, the output range of the lasers is limited, uh, we've got in touch with the, the CAA. We often in constant communication with the local airports. Uh, like at Worthing Pier, we'd call the Coast Guard every night as well. So it's actually very, very safe. It's just the, this kind of thing that seems very dangerous, which is more fun that way. So I'm, I'm sort of torn between reassuring people how safe it is and then like using the entertainment value of saying how dangerous it is. Well, that is the right way round, to have something that looks very dangerous but is safe. Because the other way round, it's a bit like Diablos. I always think Diablos, things, <laughs> see, Diablos look like they're very easy but are very difficult. So that's a really rubbish thing. Come on, look at me do it. It looks really easy. Oh, it's really difficult. Oh, well. So I think, yeah, you've definitely got that the right way around. Are we oh, going to see some more really... stuff later on? Yeah, so um, I've got to just try and get the video stream set up in the other parts of the country. Uh, once I've got that, I'll add it on. So, yeah, if you go to the website, I've put the YouTube live stream there, plus the links to the lasers. Once I get off chatting with you, I'll set up the live streams for the other two, my other two friends. So it's Rob Stanley and Danny Mason in Leamington Spa. Uh, yeah, we'll get a few more lasers going for everyone to enjoy. But if you're in the, if you're in the vicinity of any of those lasers, it's going to be much better if you look out your window and look in the sky. It should stretch for a good 20 miles into the distance so uh, yeah have a look out the window if you're near those places that's brilliant thank you so much seb that is uh, wonderful we'll catch up with stuff later on uh later brilliant. on tonight and uh, that is good uh, that, that is, it reminds me of that you remember when when rusty schweikart who you would have seen a little bit earlier when uh, when we had the lasers at royal albert hall and he had a lot of fun playing with them that's the great thing is kind of you know people who have that natural curiosity it doesn't matter that you know rusty went up in space over 50 years ago he's then given lasers goes yeah i can have fun with these it's play so much play it was so enjoyable that moment actually when seb comes back i must i, I need to pick it i've got a bones pick with him because he well, I, I had a conversation with him about all this robot MIDI remote control stuff because you know he's a bit of a tech genius and uh, he, he was pretty convinced that there's absolutely no way it could work and here we are Seb in your, in your laser face uh, oh, okay, so. let's have a nice distant fight later on. That's definitely <laughs> yeah. what we'll need about... Because I wasn't going to start drinking this evening, but it no. now sounds like maybe we should yeah, just all have maybe a couple this. before Seb comes back. <laughs> yeah. um, now, we are going to get on with... Uh, now, the, the, the next guest is someone that... Uh, well, I was working with yesterday. In fact, yesterday I was... Uh, we were recording another Infinite Monkey case. There's a new series of that starting uh, in January. We had a lot of fun talking about uh, the nature of taste and flavour with Harold McGee and Mark Miodovnik and Grace Dent and Katie Brand. And, uh, and I will be back on tour with him next year as well hopefully if everything works out uh so with some of the questions that you'd sent him i last night handed them over to brian cox and saw what he thought so ladies and gentlemen please welcome to your screen professor brian cox hello you're doing um a special event at the barbican aren't you which will be uh, on yes. sunday night around about now presumably oh, no, 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 it's the next night yeah i'm rehearsing now so now, as we speak, I'm rehearsing at the Barbican. This is, how does it work in science? So you basically split your realities. You've been both observed by the Barbican and observed by me, and now from a, a quantum perspective. It's very yeah. impressive. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics in action. Yeah, well, the many worlds interpretation of show business. Uh, let's start off with a question from Lana. Uh, Lana wants to know, what has been the most overwhelming discovery in the universe, planet-related, for you? planet related i i think it's the realization that, that there's been a shift in our perspective over the last um let's say 40 or 50 years so if you go back to the turn of the last century so 1900 let's say then hg wells and science fiction writers and professional astronomers thought that mars would very likely be a habitable world and even if you go through into the 1950s, until we flew there with spacecraft, it was not expected, but certainly considered a real possibility that there would be complex life on Mars. I mean, you know, very famously, there's Lowell's canals. And, and it is true that if you look at it through a, 
a telescope, a small telescope, then you see shifting patterns on the surface, which look like seasonal vegetation. You see a world that you could imagine is a living world. When we flew past it in the 60s, the early 60s, um, then a world was revealed that looked more like the moon. And it was a shock. And actually, there, there's a, I think uh, it was Lyndon Johnson was president at the time. And he gave a speech um, with, and, and he hesitated. I always remember it. He said, it may be, it just may be that we are um, rarer than we thought, that, that there may be no second chance in our solar system. He said that, you know, and you, you see this shock that people probably hadn't thought about. They just assumed that there'd be life everywhere. And then when we started exploring, we saw these barren worlds. But now, to get to your question, we found that these worlds could, we think, support life. Um, because Mars, we think, still has liquid water below the surface, um, perhaps large amounts. Um, and so, it, yes, it's an arid world on the surface. But you go into deep caves, you go down below the surface, we think there's a very strong possibility there'll be life there, although, albeit microbes. Same with the moons, the great discoveries of the moons of Jupiter uh, and Saturn, Europa, for example, uh, an ocean world below an icy surface. Uh, er, virtually everywhere, look, even Pluto, when we flew past Pluto, this tiny rock on the edge of the solar system, which you would think for all the world, it's tiny, it's frozen, it should be inert. And we see a world that's geologically active or has been in the recent past. We know that because it has a smooth surface. And if you have a smooth surface in the solar system, it means it's young because it means there's not been too much time for it to become cratered. So uh, we think Pluto has an internal heat source of some description, probably radioactivity, I suppose. It probably is. Uh, it's not fully confirmed, actually, but that's what I guess. So that means that there could well be a region of liquid water below the surface on Pluto even. So we've had this complete change of perspective in terms of habitats for life in our solar system, I think, over the last few years. And so we've had a roller coaster from life everywhere to life nowhere other than Earth, back to the potential for life in many places again. Well, that's, that brings us to uh, Thomas's question, uh, because this is about Venus. And of course, this has been very interesting because it seems to have changed quite a great deal in terms of possibilities. Uh, and Thomas would like to know, after the discovery of this year's uh, signatures in Venus's atmosphere, how likely do you think it is that they are the result of biochemistry? I, I think it's unlikely. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to say. It was a tremendous shock. Um, what we know, we don't know as much about Venus as we do about Mars. Obviously, it's, it, we, we've, we've landed on it. The Russians have landed on it, but very short-lived spacecraft because um, it, the, the pressure is 90 times atmospheric pressure. It's 450 degrees Celsius or something on the surface, perhaps a bit more hot enough to melt lead. Horrendous conditions. And so it's very hard to explore physically. And also, it's always cloudy. So um, we now have radar maps of the surface of Venus. So we're beginning to get a picture of the, the planet, but we don't know it as well as Mars. Um, what we do suspect is that the conditions on Venus were potentially Earth-like at some point in its past. And I've seen papers and suggestions that that might be uh, to quite recent past, by which I mean, you know, one or two billion years ago, not three or four billion years ago like Mars. Um, so it's certainly, I think, possible that life could have began, could have begun on Venus. Um, so then the question becomes, can it survive? If it, if it did, if there was a genesis on Venus, let's say, could that life have survived when the greenhouse effect took over and turned the world into, as everybody says, a vision of hell, which indeed it is? Um, I, I suppose technically it could. Um, the, the, the thesis is that perhaps there are regions, obviously, there's some region in the atmosphere between the cold of space and the heat of the surface where conditions are temperate. So you could have at some band in the atmosphere, you could have biological activity. Um, remember, you, you know, you might say, well, how do we know that you can't do biology at 400 degrees Celsius or something like that? Um, we know because we know the chemistry and, and you, you can't maintain complex carbon uh, change, you know, things like DNA or, or you know, you really would be hard pushed, I think, to imagine 
complex molecules, complex enough to transmit information, store and transmit information from generation to generation at those temperatures and pressures. I don't think we can imagine that. But um, there will be a region in the atmosphere where it will be reasonable. Um, whether that could sustain an ecosystem is 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 a good question. Well, your uh, my great hero Carl Sagan used to try and imagine these things, didn't he? Like things floating in the atmosphere mm. of Jupiter, in particular. Same problem, by the way. You know, obviously, you go deep into Jupiter's atmosphere, you're not going to survive. You're going to get squashed and boiled. And if you go up into space, you get frozen. So somewhere in there, there's a temperate zone. Um, whether you can exist you know and you know have an ecosystem there is it i i, I just doubt it but you know that, that's why we do why, why we explore and uh, there was a signature detected which is an interesting chemical signature um probably chemistry probably not biology but you never know well this leads nice and easily to one of you the traditional great questions of physics which is of course the quantum chicken this is from uh, Luke Moore. Would it be possible for a quantum chicken, chicken to occupy the superposition of both crossing the road and not crossing it? Is it possible to calculate the odds of said chicken appearing out of nowhere closer to the end of the universe? Well, the first bit, the answer is yes. Right. I mean, the, the, the thing about quantum mechanics is that it, it's a counterintuitive picture of the world um, where uh, it's not correct to describe a particle as a point like thing. So a little, your, your picture of an electron, let's say, is probably a little point-like piece of grit almost that bounces around the universe. That's not the way they are. They, they, they behave like extended objects um, with some wave-like properties. And that's, so, so that's the way we picture electrons. Another way of thinking about that, which is down to Richard Feynman initially, is that the electron actually, you can picture it as something that takes multiple paths through the universe. And in fact, all possible paths through the universe. And, and he didn't just say this, he developed a mathematical formalism called the sum over histories approach, where you can do calculations, where you assume it takes all possible paths from A to B. You can calculate a quantity that you're told to add up, and that gives you the probability that it will appear at B, given that it was at A. And you have to take all possible paths into existence, uh, into, uh, into the calculation in order to make the calculation work. So is that a real picture of the universe? Who knows? But the key point is that there's nothing in the theory that says that this only applies to small things. It, it, as far as the theory is concerned, everything is quantum. And that's what almost all physicists think. So everything is quantum. So you have to explain how the world that we see emerges from these rather well-known and well-defined but counterintuitive rules that govern the subatomic world. And then, so yeah, this is what leads to the so-called many-world interpretation of quantum mechanics, um, which would have this as being true, that you have a, uh, if, if the, let's say a chicken um, stands at the side of the road and there's some decay of a radioactive nucleus, and, and if the nucleus decays, then it detects it on a Geiger counter and walks across the road, and if it doesn't decay, it it doesn't detect it and it stays at the side of the road. Then um, in the many worlds interpretation, a very the simplest interpretation of quantum theory, then both those things happen. Um, there's, there's a world in which the thing decayed and the chicken set off. And there's a world in which the thing didn't decay and the chicken stayed where it was. And that's called a linear superposition of chicken in road and chicken outside of road, a linearly superposed chicken. And that's, that's just a, the simplest interpretation of what the theory says. Um, there's a second bit about the chicken. It was that appearing at the end of the universe. Mm. Is that the question? Yeah, um, yeah. There's a very famous, um, you can read it. If you go read some, I think Carl Sagan wrote about it, but there's, there's an idea called Boltzmann brains or the Boltzmann brain. Um, Oh, Feynman wrote that, didn't he? Uh, do you all know who wrote about the Boltzmann brains? I know Boltzmann might have been involved, perhaps. Anyway, it's a well-known point, which is that, so quantum mechanics, you're right, uh, tells you that there's always a possibility for things, uh, particles, to fluctuate into existence with antiparticles made as well. So you can't violate conservation laws of nature, like you can't violate conservation of charge or anything you can violate conservation of energy briefly as long as they go back again. 
Um, so there's always a probability things will fluctuate into existence. And um, the argument goes that given an infinite amount of time, then, you, you know, sometimes we say, well, the universe, you hear people say the universe, maybe it was a quantum fluctuation. It just fluctuated into existence. Um, you know, and that's often people who want to claim they understand what happened at the Big Bang will say that um, we don't know what happened at the Big Bang. But the point is that if you think, if you want the universe to fluctuate into existence, then it's easier for just a single brain to fluctuate into existence in which, which has thoughts like you now listening to this. Is, is it more likely that if you believe that things just fluctuate and that's the, the the explanation for the origin of everything, is it more likely it's just you or it's everything else, <laughs> right? Two trillion galaxies with all those countless stars and planets. No, it's more likely it's just you. And so these explanations fall down uh, on this. They, well, they fall down in the sense that if you want to believe there's something more than you in the universe, then really the kind of idea that things just fluctuate into existence, and that's a good explanation, uh, falls down at that hurdle. There's actually, um, Sean Carroll wrote about it in his, um, in his latest book. Something Deeply Hidden, is it? So, no, the one before that. The, uh, you know, the one, it's, it's, it's got a title that's not a good title, because I always forget it. It's a great book. Oh, Sean Carroll's big book of quiches. And then the that's that's book it, Sean about, Carroll's yeah, big book. It's a disastrous title, with nothing to do with the actual content. Right. I'm 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 actually looking it up because I don't want to do a disservice because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a great book. Carry on, carry on asking. I would also also mention that Katie Mack's book, uh, The End of Everything, all about different theories of the end of the universe, has some lovely stuff about Boltzmann's brain. Uh, brain oh, system. the big picture. It's called the big picture. Oh yeah. On the origins of life, meaning in the universe itself. It's it's a good title actually, but I always forget it. So it's probably not a good title. But anyway, the big picture. He talks about them in there. Boltzmann brains. So go and have a look at that. We've only got a minute left, but just very quickly, there's quite a few people asked about this. Just your your reaction to uh, the Arecibo radio telescope, the the, oh, wow. the, 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 the collapse there, which, which I think, again, one of those fascinating things where the emotional connection which occurs to with, with something like that, with, with something which is machinery and technology. It's, it's tremendously sad. I mean, I visited there. And it's an incredible thing to see, this telescope rising out of the jungle, basically, in Puerto Rico. Tremendously important, I should say, to the economy of Puerto Rico and to, the, to, to Puerto Rico itself. Often missed. We often forget that these great scientific facilities, Jodrell Bank being another example, um, but CERN, you know, the, the, these, these, these facilities bring much more than the science to the to the place that they exist that brought the world's great scientists to Puerto Rico. And so I think it was a, a big, well, it's a very unfortunate that, I mean, I was going to say it was a big mistake to let it get into that state. I, I suppose that's right. However, it's a very old instrument. It's subject to, it's in a quite hostile part of the world in terms of storms and things as we saw it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know the detail of whether it was repairable or not. They, they saw big problems with it. They evacuated it and it collapsed. And that's, you know, maybe that's the way these things have to be. But it's tremendously sad because, you know, that I, I mean, I, I remember speaking to Frank Drake um, in his home. Uh, Frank Drake was responsible, amongst many other things, for the Arecibo message, which was this great, you know, this transmission um, out to the stars announcing that we're here um you know with uh, you you may have seen that pixelated message that was sent out it's absolutely beautiful so it has this unique place in the history of astronomy it's done great science it's a legendary place and it's really sad to see it go um but you know i i don't know could it have been repaired could it have been salvaged who knows uh, there's one thing it occurred to me actually that um when you have it, it we always fight in science to have control of our own budget, right? We want control. We don't want politicians telling us what to spend our money on. The politicians decide how much money we'll get, but then we we um, we want. It's called, it used to be called the Haldane principle in the UK. We want to decide on scientific merit where the money goes once we've been allocated it by governments, right? Um, 
if you do that, though, it occurred to me looking at Arecibo, sometimes scientists will always choose the things that, that gets the most science. Right? That, 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 that's, that's our job, right? We want to generate the most knowledge with our money that we get. Um, whereas sometimes there are cultural considerations. Um, you know, there are heritage considerations, there are geopolitical considerations, right? They, uh, and this sometimes happens. I mean, things like CERN, you do get geopolitics involved. But, uh, you know, on the level of a radio telescope in Puerto Rico, uh, it's tremendously important to Puerto Rico it, beyond the science it delivers. And I wonder whether th- those we have the mechanisms right sometimes, um, you know, to, to maintain those great heritage sites, you know, you you can't do it really on science budgets. You need to know, you need to also take account of the cultural impact of these things. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And your show that you're recording at the Barbican is going to be on over Christmas, is it? No, it was broadcast live on um, live. Brilliant. Sunday. And you have to buy a streaming pass if you want to watch it before Sunday. Right. Um, but then you, then you can watch it later. But you can only buy the thing before sunday uh, and it's a good thing to buy i think it's about it's about 12 pounds so it's not horrendously expensive it, it, you know and, and why does it cost money to stream um because there's an orchestra there and there are musicians there and the musicians have had a horrendous year you know look at steve pretty's poor face yeah yeah <laughs> Errol, he's, all of his friends are with him on stage now and they're all just keyboards different keyboards that yeah. he has names for and friendships with thank you so much Brian. I'm li- i'd like to see as well that you were the science advisor uh for killian murphy on sunshine and you're beginning to look more you're merging now i think physically with the look of killian murphy as well there's just a oh, little this is a, about you. this is an o'neill cylinder behind me and th- th- so this o'neill cylinder is um, actually, I should say, because if we're advertising, um, I should say that myself and Robin will be on tour next year uh, in October with our big arena show. And I've gone mad, uh, right, just crazy. I've let my imagination wander. And, and I, I think what I've done is created 2001 <laughs> for an arena. So, um, so, and this is part of it. So this is one by great, great um, Scandinavian artist called Eric Vern- Vernquist, who's just brilliant. So and I think we've got a lot of this stuff. Done. Financially, you've created the equivalent of uh, New Order's Blue Monday. Packaging, which is actually more, so the more it sells, you go, oh no, it costs so much to actually make the packaging. That, I'm worried. Uh, the more popular it is, the less money you're going to make. This is a film. This is a still from a film. There's another one here. Look at that. We've got all this stuff. <laughs> you better come. Yeah, <laughs> like- it's always nice to end on a threat. Again, a little bit of- <laughs> there. Um, brilliant. See you later on. Thanks. And that was uh, Brian Cox talking yesterday, just before we recorded uh, another Infinite Monkey Cage. And uh, as he mentioned as well, the uh, the Barbican show is uh, is tomorrow night. Uh, I think it actually starts at eight o'clock. But as he said, you know, you can can buy things in advance. Uh, so, uh, Steve, how are you feeling? I'm actually feeling fine. Did- uh, did you have the little pasta in a lovely cup? I did. I did have. I've never had pasta from a cup before, but now I have, and I feel like God, I've that lived. makes you. Now I realise you've always have been the liberal media elite. Oh, if I'm, I'm really very much is, liberal me- media elite. Yeah, yeah. I just like wish I was seeing more of the fruits old. of it. Uh, yeah, I know. First time you've had pasta and cup. And you're forty. I know. Well, don't worry. This decline in your living standards may well continue throughout the next year. That's right. I never thought this this would be the the case. That my first week of being forty, eating pasta from a cup. Yeah. In a basement. And and do you know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to make you risotto in a shoe. It's just going to keep going downhill. Hello, uh, new audience who are coming in. By the way, for those of you watching at home, we have uh, an audience who are... Uh, it's been very carefully done in terms of socially distancing and uh, in terms of everyone being in masks and so forth. Uh, thanks for joining us. We've only been... Uh, uh, Steve's been on the stage for about nine hours now. I've been on the stage for about eight hours. We are filled with vim and chutzpah. And uh, we've got a lot coming up. We've got uh, very soon. We've got Ben Goldacre coming up. Uh, we've got Stuart Lee coming up. We've got uh, we've got our All Star Christmas Carol that I mentioned before with Eddie Izzard and uh, Joe Brand and Guy Pierce and uh, lots of other people. Um, I did just announce that uh, Robert Smith from The Cure has uh, specially recorded yesterday over the last couple of days. He's recorded um, just for us uh, three reworkings of uh, songs from Seventeen Seconds, uh, which was their album which came out forty years ago. Uh, so Robert Smith. 
asking me on later on. And the other thing that I'm going to mention who isn't anywhere mentioned in our publicity is quite late tonight, Sometime after midnight, uh, we're going to have a live link up with Tim Minchin as well. And Tim's going to sing a song. And uh, I think he's probably going to sing a song. And we're going to have uh, uh, a chat about what he's been creating this wor- uh, year and his new album and all of those other things as well. So there's lots more to come. And uh, very shortly, we're going to be joined also by uh, Lost Voice Guy. Who did Lost Voice Guy? Did he win Britain's Got Talent? He certainly got very high up, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if he won, I'm afraid. But yeah, he certainly did really well, didn't he? Yeah, so I think. I I think, Lee, by the way, I hope you've noticed, by the way, I've half shaved I a small amount I because going on there. I haven't taken my mask off for so long. I didn't realise that I'd kind of grown hair <laughs> under it. And uh, and it wasn't like in any way a fulsome beard or anything like that. It was just like this kind of Wilfred Bramble look. So uh, I thought I'll shave that off because I, re- I noticed it, particularly when I was interviewing Brian. And I've, I didn't have enough time to shave the whole of it off. So I've just done this side. <laughs> this side is, is lovely and smooth. This is still a little bit adult. So uh, we, we're caught between between the two worlds there. Um, and I also mentioned for everyone watching uh, at, at home as well, what we are hoping, and for everyone here as well, in fact, um, we're not entirely sure that this is, it's all going out just live, um, but then probably over the next few weeks, we will package stuff together. And uh, so things that you've missed with luck, uh, we'll be able to put them together. But we're now going to go over, hello, more people coming in. I hope you're feeling good. It's nice to have an audience. It's a strange thing. The last gig that I did with any kind of audience, uh, any live gig that wasn't just of the multitude I've done on Zoom and Skype was at King's Place. Just before lockdown, I did an event with the lovely Jeff Lloyd and with Ed Miliband. And uh, the last thing that I did on stage was explain black holes to Ed Miliband, and it blew his mind. He had he knew nothing. I didn't even get to the point of explaining that possibly black holes give us a clue that we are, in fact, all merely two-dimensional holograms projected from somewhere else in space. I was merely on the density and the fact that no light could escape from it, and that was enough to blow his mind. So uh, any interesting cosmological decisions that are made uh, by the Labour Party in the next five years, I believe, will be uh, thanks to my explanation of, uh, of black holes to Ed Miliband. Anyway, but we are back, so thank you very much for, for coming along to this. And uh, I, was, I was worried it was going to get emotional, but I think it might be about six in the morning. If we have anyone who's bought a ticket for the 6am slot, which will be an interesting one, but I do think... We ha- that, do we have a live audience at 6am? I don't know. I, I who don't is know. The, the slots that I think are most... The, the lowest booking is for the 2am to 4am slot, I think. I think that's reasonable. Uh, we don't have an audience overnight. We're not allowed to have one, actually, oh, I've been told. That's, yeah, that is okay. a pity. It is, it's a real pity. It's going to be a bit odd continuing It's just this. you and me <laughs> in a room. You and me in a pinter play, which appears to have been written by Rick Wakeman. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I'm going to introduce now uh, Chris Lintop, for those of you who didn't see earlier on. Uh, Chris Lintop with that fantastic project, Zooniverse, which is... Has, uh, do any of you know about Zooniverse? It's a really great thing. Zooniverse is basically getting members of the public to help out scientists by being their eyes. So rather than using computer programs, and it might be about natural history stuff, it might be about wildlife, it might be about kind of counting penguins and seeing that, or it is about looking out towards space and uh, talking about, for instance, uh, marking different galaxies and explaining what shape the galaxies are. And what we're doing today is a search for supernova, um, which if with luck, who knows, over the next, we've got what we've got left. 17 hours left, about 17 hours left. Over the next 17 hours, if the right ones are found, it will help us work out exactly, or not exactly, but improve our understanding of the age of the universe. So let's find out how it's going. Chris, uh, you don't have to pretend we have positive results now, but if I come to you at 6am, I'll really need a boost. So if we've had nothing, lie through your teeth. Um, What's been going on so far? Well, it's been great since we launched supernovahunters.org. That's supernovahunters.org for those watching at home. At uh, Just after, what was it, about half 12 this lunchtime, we had a flood of shambles uh, and Nine Lessons viewers. And we've actually had 30,000 classifications. So people have sorted through candidate supernovae on the site. Now, that data is from a telescope in Hawaii on the island of Maui. That's pan stars that have been taken over the last week. Uh, and volunteers have gone through it really, really quickly. And we found, we think, six supernovae so far. Brilliant. Uh, which is kind of amazing. Now, these are candidates, so the team have had a quick look at them, um, and we think they look realistic. But they are all pretty faint. 
um, right on the edge of what the telescope can do. And that makes sense. You'd expect to find more faint distant supernovae than you do nearby ones. But they may be too faint to the next part of the challenge, which is that we want to follow up on these discoveries. We've got uh, people standing by in the Canary Islands or, or using telescopes in the Canary Islands, maybe on the big island of Hawaii, wanting to follow up on discoveries. And so what that means is we need in the next few hours to get about another 70,000 classifications from, from people who are watching. And if we do that, we, we know that it works. We found uh, what might be six good candidates. We've also found a few bright ones that other teams have beaten us to. There's a telescope called ZTF or ZTF because they're American in California who had found a few things. Um, so, so we just need people to, to, to get stuck in and while they're watching the show, have a browser window open and just click through supernovae. Somebody said earlier, it was like eating crisps. You just sort of go, yeah, I'll have another one. I'll have another. One. Oh, that's an interesting this analogy doesn't work, does it? But you know what I mean. It's sort of addictive. And, and we're hoping we can, can find something exciting. That's one of those moments where you know that was Carl Sagan's first draft in Cosmos. <laughs> mm, looking for supernova like eating crisps. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> and I'm going to do that sentence again. Um, so that is that's really great news. So everyone, if you keep involved with this, uh, that is, and I, I will remind you of other stuff as well. That it, it also, please do send in your pictures for Helen Chersky. Uh, and again, any of these things. And if you want to get involved, hashtag Nine Lessons uh, Twenty Four. Uh, then you can just find out. Uh, send send us pictures of, of what you've got around the house or an image from today or this evening and Helen's going to go through them all tomorrow and create an advent calendar how there is science in some time and re you can try and trick her what she's waiting for is a really impossible photo where you think there's no science in here and Helen will find the science and also Steve is going to work on a uh, prospective uh, Christmas number one that's right which is great because progress is slow at the moment, but we'll get there. Not slept for about twenty hours, and then we're going to get to that. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so on that subject, um, I find it really helpful uh, to have a title to inspire me. So I, I've been trying to crowdsource the title. We, we, I'm uh, writing and producing a, a Christmas number one over the course of the show. Uh, but definitely going to get to Christmas number one, I'm sure. Um, so uh, if you've got any titles, then please do put them on the live chat, or you can email uh, nine lessons at cosmicshambles.com. I think it is. Uh, yeah, and also you can send in some contributions. Even if it's just you shouting Christmas, it would be nice to have a choir of, uh, of, of viewers. Oh, yeah, audience. if you just want to send in noises. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's very this much my This is jazz. Business. That's exactly. how jazz works. That's how John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, all of them, they just went, oh, someone just sent me this noise in a can. <laughs> that is why so many of the great jazz works, like A Kind of Blue, all started with just one of those cans. You turn and goes, moo. <laughs> if you listen to that. In fact, I could have it, just said a kind of moo, couldn't I? Uh, would have been I nice could have, but I'm glad I didn't because that would have been an awful pun. Good. Right. So send those things in. Steve needs noises to inspire him Christmas and words noises. to Christmas inspire noises. him. If you've got any Christmas uh, jingle bells or anything, that would be great. Brilliant. And then we're going to have Chris. You've got a little bit more to tell us of what's going on. Yeah, sorry, I forgot two things. One was that um, we're sort of on the clock here. So we need classifications in the next couple of hours so that we can get the telescopes following up so so i really want to make sure people know that they should do this right now and if they do go please log in because then we can give you credit i can see um, well gary newman was responsible for one of the discoveries i imagine it's a different gary newman uh, it may Tanya well not Stafford's. be gary newman no, loves stuff no. like that yeah um, matt masters all of these uh, shambles people have been contributed but do log in so we can give you some credit Oh, it's great hearing out that, that Gary Newman sent that because I know that Martin Fry from ABC, he'll be furious and he will be looking immediately. The two of them had a big spat on top of the pops a few years ago over something involving lexicon of love. So all now of the great synth-based, uh, I, I would imagine, Heaven 17, you know, it's in our yeah. name. It's what we do. They're going to be furious. Um, Cabaret Voltaire, who knows? Anyway, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Chris. We'll be joining you later on. And as Chris said, if you can look at the next couple of hours, uh, and that will change astronomical understanding. So that's brilliant. We're now going to go to... Uh, oh, I should just mention again as well about crowdfunding and stuff like that. Thank you very much, everyone who has turned up here. Thank you for everyone who is watching uh, back at home as well. Please spread the word as much as possible. All those things that we haven't put up about the fact that Tim Minchin and Robert Smith are going to be involved tonight and Stuart 
appropriately and all of those things. And uh, also thank you because uh, the money that we're raising, so from your tickets and from anyone who's able to donate at home, obviously you can watch for free, don't feel under any pressure, but if you are able to donate, there's four really brilliant charities which include Mind, the mental health charity, uh, and also uh, Turn to Us, which is helping people uh, with financial difficulties and uh, in poverty, and also uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, which is just a really, MSF is an, is an amazing charity, and if you've ever met, if you ever get the chance to meet anyone who works for MSF, they, they are very just great human beings and also King's Place uh, their music academy as well um, so now we have uh, the first guest now we're in the kind of uh, in the kind of light entertainment area now aren't we very much in the uh, kind of light variety show yeah um, comedy zone and someone who is just a really great comic and I've, I've seen many times and uh, the, I, I say light entertainment but the, some of his stuff has got such a wonderful punch to it and uh, he also as I mentioned before was the winner of Britain's Got Talent uh, Please welcome to this screen and your screen, Lost Voice Guy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. If you are wondering how I got disabled, it's because I didn't forward that chain email to ten of my closest friends when I was younger. I have lived in Newcastle all my life, but for some reason, I still haven't picked up the accent. <laughs> However, if you are trying to place my accent, it's from PC World. <laughs> I try to never ever wear a coat and carry around a fishing rod, a dressing gown and some chicken, just so people are sure about where I was born. Just so you are aware, I'll be doing none of the shit that other more talented, disabled people do in the Paralympics and things. Sorry to break it to you like this, but I'm not one of those superhuman disabled people. On the contrary, I'm one of these regular disabled people without any amazing abilities. Let's face it, I don't earn the title of being super just because I get to park closer to Tesco. In fact, the only impressive ability I do have is the fact that I'm the best passenger in the choir coach on the train. I am afraid that I'm not here to inspire you. I'm here for the cold hard cash. Don't be mistaken, I'm inspired by disabled people all the time but not just because they're disabled. They inspire me because they've taught me that I can use a trouser hanger to hold open my book. They inspire me because they use hair straighteners to pick up stuff off the floor. And they inspire me by the way they take advantage of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. The fact of the matter is that I'm sick of being called an inspiration. And it would seem that these inspirational quotes are everywhere these days, which just makes it worse. I can guarantee that at least a couple of your friends have them plastered all over their walls at home. They probably say shit such as, fill a house with love and it becomes a home. Or maybe, we create our tomorrow by what we dream today. And I can guarantee that you think these people are a twat. <laughs> the ones that really get to me are the stuff that gets shared on Facebook. Quotes like, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Fuck off. <laughs> For a start. Being nice to the stairs in my flat hasn't turned them into a ramp yet. No amount of positive thinking is going to help the blind man when he walks into a bookshop. And if it really is the case that the only disability is a bad attitude, then why the hell isn't Katie Hopkins paralyzed from the neck down? As you can see, those quotes are just a load of self-righteous shit. 
I don't think I've ever felt much of an inspiration to anyone. In fact, the only time I have ever felt valued as part of society is, once every few years, when you all watch inspiration porn, for a month. Or to give it its proper name, the Paralympics. As you can probably tell, I'm not really good at any sport, so I beat shit in the Paralympics. I can hardly walk, never mind run. I'm also a lazy bastard. In fact, if laziness was a sport, I'd come in fourth, so I wouldn't have to walk up to the podium. The closest I come to doing anything remotely athletic is when I used to go horse riding when I was little. Even then, I was given a horse with only one eye. It's almost as if they thought that I wasn't disabled enough already, so they thought they'd make it worse mm. by giving me a blind horse. I couldn't tell it where to go, and it couldn't see where it was going. All we needed was a deaf guy to be leading us around and with the one disability bingo. <laughs> I am quite impressed at the number of sports that have been adapted for disabled people though. It's nice that they are so inclusive these days. I reckon we should get further and adapt versions of classic board games as well. You could play a very special edition of Guess Who, where all the characters had disabilities. No one would ever win, because everyone would be too afraid to describe their character in case they caused offence. The questions would be fun as well. Is your person incontinent? Does your person have crayon around his mouth? Does your person have trouble speaking properly? Is your person Danny Dyer? You could also have a disabled version of Monopoly, where every space is just free parking. And, of course, there could be a disabled version of Buckaroo, where the donkey only has one fucking eye. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been Lost Voice Guy. If you find my voice, please contact me as soon as possible on my social media. You've been a fantastic audience. Even if you haven't, I can't really change what I say at this point. <laughs> I hope you had it fun laughing at a disabled man. Enjoy the rest of your night. Goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for coming along. And uh, um, I have a couple of questions for you before you disappear. Uh, and uh, one of them is, uh, in terms of Christmas, uh, what are your, what's your kind of attitude towards Christmas? What do you kind of, uh, um, what, do, what, do, what do you make of it and what would make a good Christmas for you? My dad never puts a lot of thought into my Christmas presents. Which is why they're always my favourites. When I was ten, he got me a pair of walkie-talkies, then got annoyed at me when I didn't reply to his messages. <laughs> if you think that was bad, a few years earlier, he had got me a Mr. Chatterbox book. That was really taking the piss. <laughs> and I've got the other thing I want to know is, how would you change the world? So the world is in a, in a, it seems like a malleable time now. How would you change it? I would like to change the world by putting dogs in charge of everything. <laughs> I think the humans have had enough chances and keep messing things up. So it's probably time for someone else to have a turn. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lost Voice Guy. Happy Christmas. 
thanks very much for watching thank you very much to everyone who supports us via patreon if you are able to support us via patreon that would be fantastic we are the cosmic shambles network uh, go to patreon.com and uh, that means we can still keep making all the different things that we do now including a, a, a new series of conversations with uh, scientists authors and performers about the meaning of existence on top of that book shambles on top of that our sunday science q a and uh also our um uncanny hour documentary series as well there's probably another one apart from that i must have must have slipped my mind but anyway keep supporting us far pay keep supporting us far keep we'll keep that in by the way we're not going to cut that because it's so real isn't it you can keep supporting us i haven't really fully recovered to be honest from the uh staying awake for 30 hours i think it may well have damaged more neurons than i imagined anyway thanks for all the support thank you it's thanks to your support i was able to damage my brain as much as i have keep giving your money to patreon.com to support us and eventually there'll be almost nothing left lucky people